Do you believe you found the skeleton? How would you tell people that was You first, first, first. How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. As I'm writing this, I'm recovering from being ill, very tired, and frankly, a bit burnt out on creationism. I decided to make a change of pace, and so I'm looking at a video from the Thunderbolts Project. You may not be familiar with them, as this is their first appearance on my channel, and they are certainly not young earth creationists, or even mostly compatible with most versions of Christianity as far as I can tell. Here's how they describe themselves on their own website. Quote, The Thunderbolt Project is the collaborative voice of the Electric Universe movement established in 2004. It is a trademark of the nonprofit T Bolts Group Incorporated. Its prime mission is to explore the electric universe paradigm. Historical and current discoveries in the sciences emphasize the dynamic role of the electromagnetic force in nature, from quantum worlds and biological systems to planetary, stellar, and galactic domains. With the growing internet presence of the Thunderbolts Project, it places a spotlight on interdisciplinary research, direct observation, and experimental work confirming the pervasive role of the electric force in nature. Among its many activities, the Thunderbolts Project hosts educational videos, sponsors meetings and conferences, and produces a comprehensive website featuring the Thunderbolts Picture of the Day, the Essential Guide to the Electric Universe, a public forum, and much more. End quote. So there it is. They are Electric Universe guys. That basically means that they think that electromagnetism is the dominant force in the universe, and that the things normally attributed to things like atomic fusion, gravity, and impact of asteroids are pretty much all actually better explained by electricity. Stars are really big capacitors in the giant circuit that is the galaxy. Craters are actually where lightning struck. Even canyons might actually be burned into the ground by electrical current. But this also leads to pseudo-archaeology and bad history, which is what I'm focusing on today. Andrew Hall claims to be an electrical engineer, and he's going to tell us how Egyptians were totally into East Im play or something like that. Anyway, here's Andy. I want to state up front that I have no training in Egyptology. A promising start. Generally speaking, if you want to overturn the consensus in a field, you first need a good grasp on that field and why the consensus is what it is. Now, that's not to say you absolutely must have formal degrees as such in the field, but you have to know it well. I'm an engineer providing an engineer's perspective on what we're about to discuss. Good to know that the Salem hypothesis extends past just young Earth creationism. The topic is electricity, of course. Y'all might not know this. But I've been employed by both the United States Navy and a multinational company as an electrician dealing with industrial-scale medium and high-voltage equipment. I wouldn't consider myself an expert on such things by any means, but I know a thing or two about electricity. And how it was used in ancient Egypt. We'll look at evidence that's been overlooked. I think it will enlighten our appreciation for the Egyptians' engineering sophistication and refine our understanding of their spiritual beliefs and practices. I don't know how much higher my respect for the engineering of the Egyptians could be. One glance at the Karnak temple complex should be sufficient to make anyone suitably impressed. But also, there's literally no evidence that I'm aware of that actually indicates the Egyptians had the ability to intentionally control electricity. This is not to suggest anyone else is wrong. Okay, if you are suggesting that the ancient Egyptians had intentional use and control of electricity, you are absolutely suggesting that basically every historian and archaeologist who specializes in Egyptology is wrong. That's what's happening here. This is just like someone saying no disrespect after saying something immensely disrespectful. That doesn't make the suggestion or the disrespect go away. Simply that interpretations may be incomplete because of what has been overlooked. Okay, let's see what you've got for this. We're going to focus on the tools being used by the characters in certain hieroglyphs. It's the characters' tools and attire, and how they are portrayed being used that we are concerned with. Well, we have our first red flag because he says that he's going to be focusing on the tools being used by people in hieroglyphs while focusing on the non-hieroglyphic image. But hey, let's go over the tools used by people in hieroglyphs, and that's basically the glyphs in groups A through D in Gardner's sign list. So in the order in which they appear in the sign list, we have walls, vases, libation stones, baskets, scepters, rope, axes, staffs, handkerchiefs, Maces, sticks, bindles, mortars, jars, beds, mats, thrones, sistra, knives, I don't know if breasts count, but breasts if they do, clubs, oars, and shields. Now, I grouped a few different things into the scepter category, but yeah, that's basically it for tools being used by people in hieroglyphics. This collage of images depicts some of the tools. So in order, that's a horned viper, a sandal thong, a jed pillar, a scepter with an animal head, and a basket. 
For those of you interested, the inscription is read top to bottom and right to left. The first symbol is I-9, the second is S-34, the third is R-11, and the fourth is S-40, and the final one is V-30. Do note that by convention, Egyptology texts display hieroglyphics for reference as they are written when read from left to right, and so the serpent and the scepter will be mirrored in most texts. The horned serpent on its own can't really be translated here, as it is almost certainly an enclitic possessive pronoun, meaning his, which is attached to a preceding word that has been cut off, but the rest of it says life, stability, and power, with a non-translatable basket glyph indicating the whole thing is being promised or offered, probably to a pharaoh, and probably by a god or the gods. This is essentially a shorthand set of glyphs. This happens a lot with important and commonly used phrases in hieroglyphics. Only the most important ideographs may be used in such cases. This is one of them. I also want to point out that I can't actually verify that this particular image is of an actually ancient Egyptian origin, as it only appears on Pinterest that I can find. They are the Waz staff, the Jed, the Ankh, the Crook, and the Flail. Good to know that he doesn't even know how to figure out which direction hieroglyphics are written in. This definitely means he has good insights for us when it comes to ancient Egyptian culture. By the way, how to figure out the direction of writing is literally the first section in Lesson 1 in my text on Egyptian grammar. It's the first thing you learn when you start trying to learn to read hieroglyphics. A few others will be introduced later, but some combination of these appear to be employed in most of the depictions we'll look at. The common attire is the headgear and collar. The headgear varies widely, but common features are the protruding antennas. I'm sorry, the what now? I really hope we're about to hear some reasons to say that anything sticking out of an Egyptian headdress is an antenna beyond looks like. Usually in the form of cobras at the forehead. Um, or vultures. And those are not antennae. They're symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt and symbolize the authority the pharaoh has over those regions. In fact, in periods when Upper and Lower Egypt were not united, the pharaohs tended to only wear one animal on the headdress. We're like a minute into this and we're already just making shit up. And the shape, although variable, always forms an absurdly voluminous envelope about the head. Which was the style at the time? No! The collar covers the chest, made of concentric rings of metals and beads of precious stones. Metals, especially gold, were used profusely in both the attire and tools, as were minerals such as lapis lazuli. Notice the positioning of the tools in the next group of images. Notice how the flail is held brushing the shoulder. The crook is held to the neck. I mean, they're both just held in a way that looks pretty natural if you want to have one in each hand and have neither of them go over your face. I'm not sure what the significance of this is. And the characters are in the act of touching each other using their hands, nose, staff, and ankh. It's almost like pharaohs ruled by virtue of claims to divine appointment and divine ancestry, and so had themselves represented in art being given things like life and authority, represented in hieroglyphics. And they often received them in the nostril, which is the place the spirit was believed to enter and leave the body after death. You know, before making things up about Egypt, Andrew could have tried to, oh, I don't know, learn anything about Egypt beyond what you might learn watching 90s Brendan Fraser movies. Not that you shouldn't watch those. You should the Ankh is often depicted held a fraction of an inch from a character's nose. Yeah, because that's where you breathe, and breath or spirit, the same word in basically all languages until pretty recently, is the thing that gives you life. So for you to receive life, that's where you take it in. Just like in the Bible, God breathed the breath of life, or the spirit of life, into the nostrils of Adam. By the hand of another. Basically always a god. In this case, it's the Aten, or sun disk, because this carving is from the Amarna period in which Pharaoh Akhenaten more or less banned the worship of all other gods but the Aten, which was depicted with rays emanating from the solar disk that ended in hands, usually carrying Ankhs, the hieroglyphic for life, because the sun gives life through its rays, and giving life is well symbolized by a hand for giving and the character for life. This really isn't that hard to interpret. What I'm suggesting is they were shocking each other. They are depicted in these images passing electric currents through each other, using their hands and tools to make connections. So far we haven't seen anything actually depicting a thing that people did. Just God symbolically giving the pharaoh the blessings and power needed to rule effectively, and also the gods performing various post-death rituals to allow the deceased to function in the land of the dead. If this is them shocking each other, I guess the Egyptians only like doing it metaphorically or after death. To my limited knowledge, no one has mentioned this before. Yeah, there's a good reason for that. There have been speculations about use of high technology concerning megalithic construction 
and even that pyramids may be a type of electrical generator. Yup, and there have been suggestions that King Charles is actually a lizard, and that the less medicine you take, the more powerful the medicine is, and that there's a sauropod hiding in the Congo. Suggestions are cheap. Evidence, though. Now that's a bit harder to come by. But I'm not aware that anyone has suggested they were zapping themselves. Yeah, because the symbolism is pretty obvious, and it doesn't indicate electroshock. For instance, in this carving, Horus is using his wasp scepter, which symbolizes his power and authority, to give life to the pharaoh. I mean, look at it. The Ankh isn't even held up by anything. It's not attached to the staff. If this were a literal depiction, the next thing that would happen isn't the pharaoh getting a shock, it's the Ankh falling. Yet that is what is being depicted. It's very simple, really. In each of the images, the characters are in the act of making connections between themselves, the floor, their headgear, and some brushy-looking implement using the tools. Sorry the Egyptians didn't depict people flying more, I guess? I don't even know what to make of this. The brushy implements appear in grounded stands. Bowls are held in hands like the flail or a fan. Note that what's pictured here isn't an implement at all. It's a lotus flower, and we can tell because the Egyptians loved lotus flowers and had a stereotypical way to draw them, and it even matches the lotus flower hieroglyphic character. The pharaoh is often depicted being fanned by his courtiers. So, a few things. That's Osiris, not a pharaoh. You can tell because he's got mummy wrappings and green skin. That's not a fan, it's a lotus, and that person isn't fanning Osiris. He's either asking for something or giving praise, and this is the pose characteristic of hieroglyph A30, which is a man with his arms raised, and is used as a determinative for words like praise, adore, supplicate, claim, be in awe, extol, and show respect. I know convention is they depict lotus flowers, Nile lilies, and such, and perhaps they are. Okay, but that interpretation is something that corresponds with the written records. And also, we know that lotuses and water lilies were around in ancient Egypt, and we don't know that for Van de Graaff Eastim Ankhs. So, you know, one of these things is more parsimonious than the other. My observation is, they are charge collectors. You know, a metal sphere and some animal fur is a way better way to do that than, say, oh, I don't know, a flower. In fact, heck, just socks on a carpet are better than a flower. Like when one rubs a wool sock on a balloon, it builds static charge. Yet another example of something much better at this than just, you know, a flower. The brushy implements may be fabric, stalks of dry rushes, animal furs or feathers that put in motion brushing another material develop a very high potential surface charge. Okay, but this is a funerary scene in which the deceased woman is given the ability to eat and drink various foods such as bread, beer, wine, and the flesh of ducks, bulls, and gazelle. Like, that's literally what's being depicted here. An afterlife banquet. In early periods, those food items would actually have been left in the tomb, but later it was thought that simply depicting them would allow them to be manifested by the deceased as a form of magic. This picture doesn't even have the ankh near her mouth or nose being delivered by a god, because this woman isn't a ruler, so she didn't need nor would she be thought to have received the blessings of a ruler from the gods. This video is just a masterclass in how to not know what you're looking at. Like a Van de Graaff generator. Hey there, Dr. Tapioca Weasel. This one's for you. Brushy implements appear as part of the circuit, being connected by hand or tool. All I see is scepters. Where are the brushy implements? That one guy's flail? You know we have flails, and they're mostly made of metal, not fine fibers like animal fur, right? The headgear and car is also meant to collect charge, with the large surface areas enveloping the head and an antenna to collect and concentrate charge at the third eye. I don't even know where to start with this one. That's not a person, that's Re Horachti, a conflation of the sun god Ra and the god Horus. You can tell because while he has the falcon head of Horus, he also has the ram horn surmounted by a solar disc of Ra. He has a crown shaped like that of a pharaoh to indicate his power, and from his head come four cobras indicating his protection. The larger cobras each wear a crown, one of Lower and one of Upper Egypt, specifying that the god Re Horachti is protecting all the land of Egypt in his power as the leader of the gods. They are using these implements to build a huge static charge, which is a very easy thing to do by just rubbing things together using the right materials. Or, and I'm just spitballing here, maybe Andrew Hall doesn't know how to interpret basic Egyptian symbolism in art, and doesn't even know how to look up hieroglyphic symbols in a reference to even begin to read them. That's a possibility too. The headgear and neckwear must concentrate charge and shape an electric field around the individual's head. 
or maybe it was symbolic and decorative, you know, like this head and neckwear. It appears in some cases constructed to produce St. Elmo's fire, or a Jacob's ladder above the head. That would require the continuous application of voltage, not just a static shock. Further, if that's what the headgear is for, can we say the same thing about Western bishops' miters? If not, why not? Are Methodist, Anglican, Catholic, etc. bishops hanging out, shocking each other there to make electrical arcs go up their hats? Or could perhaps there be other reasons that a hat might be bifurcated, even non-practical ones? In all of these depictions, they are creating a circuit to experience electric fields, frequencies, and currents around their heads. Again, this is a banquet table with cake, bread, baskets of something, wine, and animal haunches, all surmounted by a decorative lotus. These are generally not items known for their ability to maintain an electrical charge. Has anyone noticed this before? <laughs> no. No one has noticed this before. And no one has noticed it yet. Because Mr. Hall's inability to learn the first thing about Egyptology doesn't mean that Egyptians were all about East Em scenes. An awareness that Egyptians used electricity is not novel, but head zapping. It's known they made batteries because they're an artifact. Actually, those aren't Egyptian. Those are the so-called Baghdad batteries. They can make a tiny voltage if you construct them in the ideal way to make a battery, but that means you have to assume that making voltage was their real purpose. But in fact, they were found with papyrus rolls in them, and similar jars were found with rolled up lead strips. Now, the papyrus fell to dust, and so we can't read them. But the lead had curses on them. These were probably magical repositories where you'd write curses on papyrus or lead, roll that up, fill the jar with some wine, perhaps as an offering, and then bury it in the ground so that the gods of the underworld would receive your offering, and if pleased, perhaps carry out your curses, or grant you the petition or protection you asked for, if that's what you had on your strips of papyrus or lead. In fact, the idea of writing spells on papyrus or lead and then burying it persisted well into the Roman period in the Common Era. Or, you know, maybe Egyptians thousands of miles away were using these to generate about half a volt a pop for some reason. And they electroplated everything with gold like it was powdered sugar. No, it was gold-plated, but not electroplated. And we can tell because the gold is too thick to be electroplating. Electroplating leaves behind an almost microscopically thin layer of metal. Instead, gold foil, which was made by hammering refined gold into a thin sheet, was wrapped around the object to be plated and then hammered lightly to fit the contours of the underlying object. Now, this plating was more than 10 micrometers thick, whereas electroplating typically leaves a layer almost half as thick and down to a 40th as thick. You can't just assume that anything coated in gold was electroplated, especially when there are other methods to plate something in gold. But has anyone ever suggested they were shocking their brains? Not that I'm aware of, no. There are interpretations of these same implements as sonic frequency devices, which makes exceptionally good sense. Sonic frequency devices? So they're tuning forks? I thought they were for shocking people, not producing consistent notes. Up until now, the ideas in this video were at least internally consistent, but now it's just off the deep end. And you could argue that AC current can produce sound at certain frequencies in conductors, which is true, but that requires alternating current, not just static charge. That doesn't produce sound except for at discharge. And then it's a sharp crack, not a lasting tone. However, for a good buzz, electric fields and discharge do the same thing, way better. Besides, holding a vibrator in the hand dampens the vibration unless it's being fed energy. Andrew can do whatever he likes with vibrators, but I can't help but notice that in the picture he's showing us, the pharaoh is not holding anything in his hands, much less a marital aid. The depictions show circuitry between characters, the floor, furnishings, and implements providing continuity between points of charge collection and generation. Except again, those implements are just floating in the air, and they're specifically also the ideograms for life and stability, coming from a staff that itself is used as an ideogram for power or authority, and it's coming from the goddess. I'm also not entirely sure this represents authentic Egyptian art. I can't seem to find this picture anywhere online, but that doesn't mean much. Almost anyone outside of consensus science has already concluded by now that the Dendera light bulb hieroglyph is depicting something electrical. Well, that just indicates that the non-mainstream has basically no ability to think critically. So this is another example of looks like with no detail. Also, by calling this a hieroglyphic, it shows that Andy has no idea what a hieroglyphic is. These signs here are hieroglyphics and declare that the person at the base of the bulb is the golden one, lady of the third month. 
that is Hathor, since the third month in the Egyptian calendar is named for that goddess, even today in the Coptic calendar in use by the Coptic Orthodox Church, who are the last vestige of the Egyptian language left in Egypt and who American Christians might want to look at for an example of a group of Christians that are really being persecuted. But the carving itself is not hieroglyphic because it doesn't directly encode language. Anyway, we know that Egyptians used fire to light the inside of their temples, including this one, for the simple reason that the temples have soot on the ceilings from the fires. Here's a picture where Egyptian authorities cleaned part of the ceiling of this very temple and left soot on the other part as an illustration of that very fact. Granted, this is from a blog called Two Boomers Abroad, which I normally wouldn't use as a source, but the pictures are excellent and illustrate the point very well. Further, while it's easy to make a light bulb that kinda looks like this carving, that you can make a functional thing that looks like another thing doesn't mean that the thing was always the functional thing you made. For example, here's a pizza cutter in the shape of the Starship Enterprise. That doesn't mean that the Starship Enterprise is either real or a pizza cutter. Italy looks kind of like a high-heeled boot. That doesn't mean you can wear the actual Italy on your leg. Now, let's look at the bulb in question. The shape in the middle, which is thought to be a filament, should be noted to not actually come back to the base. Which means that even if it were a thin filament of metal, it couldn't light up because it doesn't complete a circuit. Further, the thing has a mouth and an eye because it's literally a snake. The base of the bulb itself is also literally a lotus flower, and is depicted here in the way that is identical to the lotus glyph M9, the determinative for lotus, and which also occurs in the text around the carving. So we know for a fact that it's a lotus. So what's the bulb? Well, it's the scent of the lotus, because this is a creation scene in which Hathor causes a primordial lotus to come from the waters of chaos and bring forth the universe with its scent, starting with a cosmic serpent. Gee, sounds sort of like the start of a chaos conf like we get with God and Leviathan in the Psalms, or with the gods and Tiamat. It's almost like all these cultures had extensive contact and trade of both goods and ideas back in the Bronze Age. Weird, right? Now, this might not be the creation narrative you're most familiar with for Egypt, but the fact is that they had a lot of creation myths that gained and lost favor over the millennia. And Egyptian practice in the temple of a particular deity wasn't too concerned if it technically contradicted parts of what was going on in the temple of another one. And this is a temple to Hathor, so she is given prominence in the creation story there. So to sum up, there is counter evidence to the idea that the ancient Egyptians had light bulbs, and that actually doesn't look very much like a light bulb unless you really want it to. With what we've just discovered, Let's take a closer look at that particular set of hieroglyphs. Does he mean the ones again identifying this as Hathor with the symbol for gold based on a gold necklace that's so closely associated with Hathor that one of the definitions listed for the word for gold is literally just Hathor? Or does he mean the whole carving because, again, Andrew here doesn't know anything about Egyptology? The entire scenario depicts a circuit with the jet delivering capacitor charge to what appears to be a giant light bulb. Okay, then what about the versions where there's no jet pillar? Also, how is a capacitor supposed to deliver charge through the glass bulb without touching the filament? It has to be wired to the base. Isn't this guy an electrical engineer? Also, we're just assuming that the jet pillar, which is actually a symbol of stability and is modeled after bound sticks, much like the Roman fasces, was actually a capacitor of some kind. That on its own will require a lot of evidence. It clearly shows halos of plasma discharge between the seated characters in the bulb into their heads. I see literally nothing that could be described as anything between any of the characters in the bulb. Like nothing. Is that what it looks like when the ancients depicted plasma? Nothing? Is every blank wall in Egypt actually an elaborate depiction of plasma? When I make a thumbnail for this channel, am I starting with a picture of plasma before I add anything and then take the plasma away? At least with the light bulb claim, there's something physically represented. With this plasma discharge, there's nothing. Further, light bulbs don't just generate plasma that you can discharge from the outside. You might know this if you've ever, oh, I don't know, owned a f light bulb and not had it generate plasma. The bulb is a giant plasma ball being charged by a big ass capacitor. With a snake inside. Yeah, that checks out. There is circuitry, frequency, and discharge into people's heads taking place here. And is the frequency in the room with us right now? The jet appears to be a primitive plate capacitor. More looks like. Got it. Is it that, though? Because lots of things can look like a capacitor, but that doesn't make them capacitors. It's plates likely made with a crystalline stone to store charge, separated by air gaps in a dielectric core, stood on an isolated central pillar. It is portrayed as part of the circuit 
often in context with characters using bare hands or bladed connectors held to jump the plates. Oh cool, so we found an actual artifact of a jet pillar with conducting plates, air gaps, and an electrically isolated base, right? No, of course we haven't, or he'd be bringing that up instead of just talking more and more about his pareidolia. The ankh, staff, or hand is used to deliver the spark and control continuity for the energy to flow through the individuals. Okay, so the ankh, staff, or hand channels the energy from the jed pillar to the individual about to get a static boop. That means that the booper has to be electrically connected to the jed pillar. But that hasn't been evident in any of these depictions. Even if we accept that the jed pillar is a capacitor and not a symbol of stability, which we know it to be, this isn't internally coherent. The pictures don't depict what they should if that were the case. We can confirm people in those times considered the staff a type of spiritual tool used to convey magical power. That seems kind of fair, although it was a symbol of power, but then it's not like political power and spiritual power were considered very separate in ancient Egypt. Because it is explicitly depicted that way, not only in Egypt, but in the Bible and other works. That's true. Electricity would fill that bill. Okay, but so would amphetamines. So maybe the Ankh is actually just delivering a massive dose of amphetamines. Why is that less reasonable than electricity? I can make up any old thing and say that's what's really going on, despite the Egyptians having told us in their own text what's going on. And it's not electric boops. The Ankh is considered the key of life by experts, a tool the gods use to deliver the spark of divine life to the pharaoh, through his nose for some reason. No, it's not a tool. It's literally the word for life in the Egyptian writing system. But this was a time when words were thought to have metaphysical power when written or spoken. So by delivering someone the Ankh, you were literally delivering them life. And life is tied inextricably to breath, as I've already noted, and breath comes from the nostrils. Like, this really, really isn't that hard to understand. It's even very similar to the Genesis 2 narrative in the Bible. Something most English speakers are well aware of. Spark of life, indeed. Zap your sinus cavity, and you'll feel alive, all right. I mean, I guess, but if it's just about causing pain with electricity, a boop on the nose isn't the most effective way. There's a reason why when someone decides to use, um... What did Bush 2 call it? Oh, right. Enhanced interrogation on someone with a car battery, they don't hook the battery across the person's nose. There are much more sensitive bits, and the Egyptians were not shy about those bits. There's another type of tool that appears to be a lamp or incense burner. Or, you know, a pipe. In context with the other implements, I think these are tools that produce ionizing flames. I think they're tools that produce drug-infused flames. How shall we test this? Well, in my corner, we have that Egyptian mummies have been tested positive for drugs, and in Drew's corner, we have wishful thinking. I'm not saying that makes me right, but it means I at least have some corroboration. Perhaps they contain reactions using carbon black, magnesium, oils, or other reactive elements. Yeah, maybe, and that's testable. Find some artifacts of these items and test them for the residue of such chemicals. Then, if and when those come back positive, we can have a discussion about ionizers in ancient Egypt. Notice the tools in the images have two parts, one being a wand that contacts the flame and the lamp itself. It's almost like people don't want to get burned when they manipulate things that are on fire. What weirdos. Perhaps a wand is a catalyst or flux to generate ions when heated. Or it's basically a poker. Seems both are equally likely. And the other tools are positioned near to accumulate charge. Or they're just being held out while Horus gets some of that dank stuff. Note that I'm not actually saying that I think that's what's going on. I'm just making an alternate and more plausible interpretation. These look to be depictions of preparing the tools. I mean, yeah, basically, it's a servant carrying scepters, lotus flowers, pots of probably oil, etc. to the pharaoh. By saturating or desaturating them of charge before use. What? They're just being carried. Is this guy smoking the same thing Horus was? Desaturating makes perfect sense as an act of purification to exhume any lingering spirits before the next use. Yeah, but so does just being a servant carrying stuff to Pharaoh, which is literally what's depicted. In the next painted image, note the circuitry. Note that some characters are on pedestals and some not. I see no circuitry, and the characters on pedestals are gods, probably placed there, literally because setting them on pedestals makes them more important. Note the same pattern and color of dotted and hashed lines used for the hook staffs are used to outline the headgear. 
It appears they are touching to float current through their arms and headgear, using staffs and other tools. The motif might represent how charge diffuses through the circuit. What if the motif is actually capitalism, because this is a modern painting that you can buy on Amazon and not on ancient anything? Oh wait, that's exactly what it is. Andrew could have just done the first bit of research, but no. It appears the central characters are about to transfer charge they have built up to the pharaoh's hat while standing on pedestals. The pharaoh is grounded, and his crown and flail are a different color, perhaps to indicate he's purified with the opposite charge and ready for a high-voltage connection to the gods. And there are three cartouches suspended at headgear level, and two orbs above that also bordered in this pattern. They look to represent physical objects present in the diagram and not just bordered text. Cool, they are just bordered text though, and on, again, a picture that's not from ancient Egypt. I mean, look how sloppy the owl and the duck are. Look at this text in the cartouches. They don't even properly fit. This is like looking at Monty Python and the Holy Grail for evidence about life in the medieval period. It's just dumb. There are instances it's hard to tell if a glyph is showing a tax box, a physical item, or both. Perhaps we miss a layer of meaning, and the cartouche represents prayer wheels that when spun generate an electric field with the grounded floor. Nope, they literally just indicate that the name enclosed is the name of a pharaoh, and they don't normally have these banded details. That's something the modern artist who painted this just made up. And that Andrew Hall is just importing back to ancient times because he knows so little about ancient Egypt that he thinks this modern painting is actually an ancient depiction from thousands of years ago. Enveloping the characters and amplifying voltage potential. The shockers are isolated on pedestals to generate a step voltage between them and the pharaoh, who is grounded. Or, you know, they're elevated because being gods they're more important than the other people in the scene. Or perhaps charge is generated in a dedicated room with batteries and capacitors and delivered to the wall by an electrode. Yeah, maybe. And maybe it's delivered via phoenix tears made to save some dumb kid after he's been bit by a basilisk. Who knows? But we can always put up random pictures that Andrew can't interpret as evidence. I mean, who's to say, besides people who do know what they're talking about, what the picture depicts, right? It appears to me the pharaoh liked to get shocked. The bigger the better. Maybe this was how he proved his strength, his divine connection to the power of the cosmos, and his ability to share that energy with his people. It seems entirely consistent with established interpretations that they were using electricity this way, and even confirms why they considered these hats and tools so significant. Today on the Thunderbolts Project, the author's barely disguised fetish. They were celebrating the spark of life from the standpoint of people who used electricity in their lives and understood they were dealing with the cosmic force. Yeah, they were celebrating life. Why do we then have to go farther and add in stupid conjecture about electricity founded on pareidolia? What does that add? All it does is just introduce random nonsense with no evidence to back it up into our conception of the ancient past. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that most random nonsense that someone could make up about the past is false, so we should avoid believing it. I think it's we who get lost in the centuries of layered dogmas about their many gods and underestimate the profound understanding of nature they possessed. Except, you know, we can just read their texts and they don't seem to mention anything about light bulbs, capacitors, or electric boops. I think this is true of other ancient cultures as well. And we, the linear reasoning, scientific reductionists, have long ago accomplished the goal of reducing our awareness. That sounds like some spirit science level obfuscation right there. Oh, you just don't understand how right Andy is because you're not on a high enough level of consciousness frequency Christitude. Once Thoth the Atlantean grants you your third eyeball, your pineal gland will decalcify and you'll become one of the alien angels from the Pleiades and understand that the Egyptians totally had electricity, bro. Another aspect to consider is these electric ceremonies are being conducted, one can assume, in temples constructed of megalithic stone. Fun fact, megalithic stone is just a fancy way to say big rocks. And yeah, most of the monumental architecture in Egypt was made of big blocks of stone. Mostly things like granite, limestone, and sandstone. Several glyphs portray pedestals the characters sit on or touch. Some appear to be inside some kind of chamber. These rituals may have been conducted in the bowels of the earth inside granite chambers or in the open air on platforms that amplified Earth's natural electric field. And for evidence so far, we have that Egyptians used big rock. Not really sure how that leads to geomagnetic amplification chairs. 
I'm beginning to question whether Andrew Hall actually is an electrical engineer, because if he were, I'd expect him to be better at electromagnetism. If they were in chambers using ionized gases, they would necessarily be rarefying the air. This could enhance plasma activity tremendously, but might have consequences such as death by suffocation or toxicity. Perhaps they generated a tolerable gas like helium, or perhaps the exposure was limited to an anteroom where a brief purification ritual took place. These are things to consider. Or perhaps they went into these secluded chambers in hopes to avoid the watchful gaze of ceiling cat. Endless speculation isn't the one thing Andy has been missing this whole time. It's evidence. The floors are key, though, to every circuit. We can assume they are stone and likely conductive. No, we can't assume that. We, in fact, know the opposite. The floors are still there, and they're made of stone that is, in fact, electrically isolating, with very high resistivity. If Andy weren't such an ignoramus, I'd think that he were just lying here. Seated characters are often on isolating pillows or pedestals, building potential before grounding their tool to the floor. How do we know that those pedestals aren't electrically isolating and not conducting? We don't. It's just that that would be convenient for Andrew's story. Nothing about the art is depicting the electrical properties of the furniture, and we know that Egyptian furniture at least sometimes featured metal, so at least some of it was conducting. In fact, thrones were often gold-plated, as we found in the tomb of King Tut. If anything, it's safer to assume that these bits of furniture were in fact conductive and would have served to ground out any accumulating static charge rather than letting it grow. Characters are also seated on low thrones that appear grounded to the floor and layered in appearance, as if they could be a type of capacitor. But again, we have actual physical ancient thrones, and they're not layered internally. They're decoratively banded, which means that again, this is just looks like. And in this case, we know for a fact that looks like is wrong. That, I imagine, would send a shock up their spine right through the top of their silly hat. Passing current through the spine, sinuses, and skull has some exotic effects. Yeah, like potentially death. We know it works for lobotomy. Lightning victims generally have bad effects. What, and people who get lobotomies don't? Is this guy arguing that Egyptians are lobotomizing themselves with artificial lightning for spiritual kicks? That's... Um, quite the claim? I don't think I need to debunk that beyond just repeating the claim in clear words. But on the other hand, there are marital aids made with plasma electrodes, so sparks can't be all bad. And there it is, the marital aids. You know, I was mostly joking about this being Mr. Hall's barely disguised fetish, but I'm pretty sure it's mask off. This guy just likes East him, and hey, more power to him as long as he's safe about it. But also, maybe don't pretend that everyone in the past shared that fetish and that because of that, all of history is wrong. Hopefully the Egyptians knew how to get positive results. Because Andy sure does. I believe their use of granite, sandstone, and limestone for temples and all manner of subterranean vaults, their placement over aquifers and other water features, and their locations around the world were chosen strategically to make use of Earth's electric field. If only all those rocks weren't electrical insulators, but alas, they are. What I can say for sure, as an engineer, is that the little copper, bronze, and iron connectors found in megalithic stone foundations all over the world have no structural purpose. Okay, but he's an electrical, not structural engineer, so I trust his structural expertise about as much as I trust his Egyptological expertise. Any force large enough to move several tons of stone would snap these pins in a heartbeat. The only rational purpose is to provide electrical continuity between stone blocks to distribute charge evenly and not cause unwanted sparks at the joints. That would work if the joints were connecting electrically conductive materials. Instead, they're joining electrically insulating materials, which means that they can't conduct electricity between the blocks because the blocks themselves don't conduct electricity. I'm calling it. This guy is either lying about being an electrical engineer or he's lying about believing this nonsense. I don't know how to any longer think otherwise. The same is true for why they meticulously made it stones together without mortar, to provide solid continuity. And the enigmatic nubs left on otherwise finished stones is not for lifting, or because the stone workers got lazy. They are positioned around gates, doorways, and passageways 
to deflect discharge away from where people walk. You know, Grand Central Station today is mostly made up of granite. And for some reason, no one needs to have special discharge knobs to keep electricity away from the people in the station. Why is that, you might ask? Oh, because rock doesn't really conduct electricity in the first place. And why couldn't these knobs be attachment points for ropes? Well, because Andy said, nuh uh, and then gave an impossible alternate explanation. This is further reducing my ability to believe that Andy is being entirely honest with us. I also can't help but notice that we seem to be moving away from Egypt. An energized stone, especially one being struck by lightning, will absorb and discharge current, and one doesn't want that to happen across the doorway you're walking through. Fortunately, it won't, because even if the stone could conduct electricity, the doorway is an air gap with even more resistance than the now somehow conductive stone, so the electricity, following the path of least resistance, would stay in the stone and discharge to ground. This is pretty basic electrical knowledge. So the nubs are collector points for charge to accumulate and discharge safely, and help desaturate the stone near the seams, openings, and walkways they're placed around. How would they do that if they're in electrical contact with the system that's supposedly sparking dangerously? They'd just be another point for sparks to originate. You'd be no less likely to be shocked by the door than by any one of these nubs if the system were really conducting so much electricity that it can overcome the resistance of air. There's no doubt in my mind that ancient Egypt was a different world than we know. Andrew will have to excuse me if his confidence in an idea decreases my confidence in that idea. With a different Earth potential, a different frequency, different energy, a more electrified environment compared to ours, and they used it in ways we must struggle to imagine. Yeah, well, the Earth also had a different polarity charge matrix. I remember because I was alive back then, and I could onka boop so anti-clockwise that it would make your frequencies dance. And don't worry, I had the best frequency in town. See, I too can do word salad. Because it is a world foreign to us. It's convenient how he just assumes basically that physics was different a few thousand years ago, because, you know, that would make his ideas make more sense. It's basically just accelerated nuclear decay from young Earth creationists, but with a different mythical basis. The article linked below sheds some light on ancient construction practices. It's titled MIT Engineers Create Supercapacitor from Ancient Materials. This article describes how MIT engineers made a capacitor from cement, water, and carbon black. Their experiments show a slight doping of carbon black with concrete allows it to hold a useful capacitor charge. The team calculated that a block of nanocarbon black doped concrete about 3.5 meters on a side can store about 10 kilowatt hours of energy, enough for the average household's daily use. In other words, your home's foundation could be your energy storage device with this technology. Likewise, the Egyptians and other megalithic builders use granites and other stones with natural electrical properties. Non sequitur, your facts are uncoordinated. So that had nothing to do with anything, since the Egyptians weren't big on concrete. That was more a Roman thing. And know that there is no source for granite being particularly good for capacitors. It's just, hey, some things that existed a long time ago were good for an electrical purpose. Therefore, anything from a long time ago might have also been good for an electrical purpose, and therefore must have actually been used for that purpose. Granites are composed of silicate, silicon and oxygen compounds with a bit of other elements mixed in that form crystals and platelets that readily diffuse charge. Granite is highly conductive. Okay, so the resistivity of granite is 10 to the 12th ohm centimeters. For copper, it's 1.7 times 10 to the negative 6th ohm centimeters. So, you know, a quintillion times less conductive than copper. I'm not sure about you, but anything that's a quintillion times less conductive than copper seems like it's not really a good conductor. But hey, maybe this electrical engineer knows a secret that I don't. In piezoelectric, which means if it's vibrated, it generates electric current. No, it means that the individual crystals can generate a charge when compressed, but this does not mean you can simply shake granite to make power. The net charge across the whole block of granite is going to basically cancel out. Sonic vibration would be the easiest way to stimulate the stone and give it a frequency. Well then, I'm sure that Andy is about to publish his positive results on playing music to blocks of rock in order to get electrical power out of them. I'm not holding my breath for it, but surely it's on the way, right? It would generate a direct current pulsed by the resonating sonic frequency. A pulsed direct current. Is that just an alternating current? I'm not sure. Sounds like it might be, though. 
Although I suppose if the voltage always has the same sign, then technically it's not alternating current. Maybe that's what he's going for. It appears everything they did was based on static charge and discharge. So not direct current generators then. See, again, we're being internally incoherent. Obviously, because Nikola Tesla hadn't been born yet. What does that have to do with anything? I can imagine deep in the bowels of a temple, being surrounded by granite's natural energy, enhanced by sonic vibrations delivered by trumpets and drums from the pageant outside the chambers. I don't know, I can imagine quite a bit. Waiting patiently for my spiritual awakening, while incense fills the room with dense aroma, and the only sound is a hum and crackle, as priests turn tables of feathers against my skin, speaking incantations. These things fill my mind with hallucinations, charge my body with dry anticipation, and encase my head with a buzzing presence. Then wham! Somebody pokes an ack at my nose, and fire shoots my butt to the top of my head, energizing chakras I didn't know I had. Well, now we've all had a little peek into Andy's fantasy life. Not sure why we needed that, but there it is. I could see someone doing that. Not me. Somebody who deserves it, like a pharaoh. Oh, I think maybe he's a sub, too. Hey, that's cool. But again, one modern person's fetishes don't really mean anything about the ancient past. The Mayan kings stabbed their penises, which sounds a whole lot worse. Okay, this is getting awkward. Maybe this guy just needs to put this stuff on FetLife or something. I'm sure he can find some like-minded people there who will dress up like a pharaoh or a Mayan king or whatever. Perhaps electric current stimulated a spiritual experience. This AI trash is unacceptable, by the way. It's so f***ing bad. How's that beard attached? What's going on with his teeth, or his ears, or even the bridge of his nose? Why are the bands all misaligned on the headdress? The more you look at it, the worse it is. People, don't let your friends use AI art past the concepting stage. Perhaps it enhanced psychic ability. Perhaps it stimulated psychedelic experiences. Perhaps it embiggened the cosmic consciousness into the ethereal realm. But you have to watch out for face fighters. Perhaps all three. Maybe that's why their gods have dog heads. What? How does that follow? What's the connection? This whole thing is just a descent into kinky madness. If one thinks about it, head zapping might be considered for many ancient mysteries. No, I think that seems to work better the less you think about it, not the more you think about it. Do we really accept these monstrosities were caused by binding a baby's head? Yes, because it still happens today. Or did head zapping cause it to unnaturally grow this way? What would the mechanism for that even be? Did the Egyptians really make astronomically complex constructions from stone by pounding and cutting with copper saws? Yes, they told us. They did it in their text and art, and nothing in the archaeological record contradicts this. How is it that this guy thinks both the Egyptians were so smart they mastered electricity but also so dumb they couldn't figure out stacking rocks on each other. I don't get it. Or did they employ electric currents with the stone to make it disaggregate and therefore be more malleable? No, they did not, because that's just not a thing. That would be melting the rock, and if the rock were melted, we could tell. For instance, if you melt granite, you get back rhyolite, and that's not what was used. These are the questions that I ponder when I look at the works of ancient Egypt. I guess some people ponder stupid things. I'll close with some more images where I see elements of electric circuitry. I encourage you to look with electric eyes and see what you find. So I guess maybe I'd get it if I had robot eyes instead of stupid meat eyes? Oh well, yeah, that was something, and it just got worse and worse as it went. It was nice to take a break from creationism, but I think after this I'll be going back to it with a fresh appreciation. At least most of them aren't obviously just talking about their kinks the whole time. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, hit like and tell me in the comments. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovind, Tapioca Weasel, Whispers, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Denny5252, Eleron Teller, Phil Havara, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mavity Babby, Monkey They Them, Mrs. Spexinder, The Venerable Bead, Sphincter of Doom, and Star Runner. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, 
There's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.